Julie, did you just say that I would volunteer to take selfies with everybody? Well, yes, you, kind of. You see how many people are in here? Well, you know, I mean, we're Google, so we can be really efficient. We can streamline this process. <laughs> how about if we take a selfie with one person and then green screen everyone's face? OK, we can do that, for sure. <laughs> All of the people that we want to be in that selfie, right? No, I'm happy to take selfies. It's just, I'm just razzing you. OK, thank you. <clears throat> have some more if you want, so. <laughs> How are you? I'm great. Yeah? Yes. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, you said this already, right? I'm native San Franciscan. So um, it's great to come home, and uh, it's great for my mom to come home and do a play in oh, yeah. my hometown and stuff like that. It, it, it's not really, uh, it's a big deal uh, for my family, kind of. So I love it. And I love this theater. I've always loved this particular theater, American Conservatory Theater, ACT. and I. Uh, so it, this is a really great kind of collaboration with them that allows me to have this hometown experience mm -hmm. and to do a play like this one that I really, I really believe a lot in this particular play. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about more about the play. Okay. I got to see it on Wednesday. It was oh. fantastic. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, but I'm hoping more people here and folks on the live stream would come to see it. So can you tell us a little bit about the show? Uh, yes. Well, Lauren, uh, Lauren Yee is the playwright. Mm -hmm. Lauren Yee is also a native San Franciscan. Yes. If you know anything, I mean, there was a big article about her in the pink section on Sunday, um, but very briefly, she really writes a lot from her own experience and her own family and has written two plays, in fact, that are inspired in one way or another by her father. This particular play is inspired by the fact that her father played basketball in Chinatown in the early 70s and was on a basketball team of kids from China, San Francisco Chinatown mm -hmm. that went to China to play exhibition games uh, throughout China. And so she's written a play about a young, um, very enthusiastic um, Asian American boy uh, in high school who um, like wills his way onto the team to go play in China um, and kind of have this kind of what's it like for an Asian American kid to go to China experience. Mm -hmm. um, and the, there's a lot more to the play, and a lot more is revealed in the play. But um, the, the play also centers around the relationship between two basketball coaches, a Chinese basketball coach and an American basketball coach, and I play the Chinese basketball coach. So that's it, basically. OK, basically. Um, yeah. and, and also kind of in its identity, it's, it's, a, it's a comedy with a really strong emotional undercurrent, which is very rare in plays to me. I find the most successful plays, plays that are, are successfully funny and move you at yes. the same time. I, I, did you find it that way? I did, yes. And I find that Lauren's work in particular, she just did King of the Years at SF Playhouse, mm -hmm. which is also another story about Larry. Yes. Um, but I really like her work because she does straddle humor and touching some soft points about family relationships, which I think is really heartwarming about her yeah, work. Yeah, she's really skilled in that. And the extra added, I mean, I really, I'm here to sell tickets, right, of course, but. Please, But, please but, do. but I really, <laughs> do really sincerely recommend this experience uh, of seeing this play in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And also, you, it's too late to see King of the Years at, at San Francisco okay. Playhouse, but I would definitely have recommended that. And when I went to see it, uh, uh, King of the Years, yes. I sat there thinking, how is this play ever done anywhere but in San Francisco? The resonance was so strong. The, 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 the places that she mentions, the, the, the locations, the things that we all know, or that many of us know, you know, that we draw from our own childhood and experiences are, um, are really uh, strong. Mm -hmm. And they're much stronger. You know, this play has been done King of the Yees and The Great Leap have been done all over the country. Yes. But there's something really special about seeing San Francisco productions about it. They're yes. going to be rare. It's, not, it's a rare opportunity. But the one thing that I think you might have noticed is that the audience is kind of like, they just get such a kick out of yeah. hearing about things that they know. Mm -hmm. And that's not an experience you can have that often. And I think one of the things that a regional theater does when it's being successful is kind of connecting to the community in a way that this play, <laughs> a local playwright and a local actor can help them do. Yes, I would agree. And it's even more special when 
the audience can really relate and s visually see the locations. I mean, in the Great Leap, it's USF, it's Chinatown, yeah. Galileo High School is also yeah. mentioned. And so they're already along the ride for you. There's not, I mean, you obviously have to work for the story, but yeah. it's kind of nice when they're already with you. When they're already, Winnie, yes. absolutely. <clears throat> and, and I had the really good experience of doing the same play in New York right. last year. And one of the major joys of doing it again here mm -hmm. is my seeing the difference of how the audience reacts to certain things. And I, I love the way the San Francisco audience um, responds to the San Francisco-ness of the play. It's, it's, you can feel it and you can hear it and it's, it's really exciting. There's a line in the play where the, the American basketball coach is telling the kid, you know, I, I played in, I, I went to China and I, and I coached the Chinese basketball players and they don't wanna like, you know, rough each other up and they don't wanna, they don't wanna touch each other. That's, I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he says. <laughs> and the kid says, uh, have you ever been to Chinatown? <laughs> and that line is a very perfectly funny line in New York City, but in San Francisco, the audience just loves it. Yeah. They just love, knowing that the playwright really knows what yes. pushy Chinese people in, in Chinatown all, <laughs> on the 30th Stockton are like. <laughs> so true. So, yeah. so true. Uh, and you mentioned you did this play in New York. And so uh -huh. this is the second time around. What is it like to play the character for the second time? It's great. I, um, the, 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 Whenever you do a play in a different theater, mm -hmm. it's going to be different. But this is a, even more so different than that because the, it's a completely different theater company that did the play. It was a completely different director and different actors. So I'm the real only kind of consistent thing in it. So, <clears throat> and the, uh, the other big difference is that the theater was very small in, in New York. Yes, it was a 99 seat theater. Mm -hmm. And this is an 1100 seat theater. And just technique-wise and um, uh, physically, it's a completely different production. It's a big set. It's a, this, this version is much more like a Broadway show right. than the one we did in New York, where uh -huh. Broadway is. So <clears throat> that experience is really um, a learning experience for somebody like me because you're always surprised at the new things that you can discover mm -hmm. when, when the play is opened up in a much bigger way. Right. Lots of things like, like there's I have more costumes in this production than I had in the first production, and and usually you'd think uh, the play, the storytelling of the play requires certain characters to wear certain costumes at certain times, mm -hmm. and that's true. But I was able to because the theater was so small wear the same thing throughout the entire play, and it worked really well because that character was consistent throughout right. from 1971 to 1989. This time, because it's so opened up and big, when I walk off the stage and I come back on again and it's a different time period, you kind of want to see me yeah, dress you differently. See the progression. And so I, I was at really kind of thrown off at first. I thought, oh, I'm going to wear all these, like the first day they show you all the sketches and stuff. And I was really surprised at that. And then I, my mind had to click over to, oh, I see, I, I see this differently now. And that is an example of a lot of different things that have happened, the, the way you use your voice and all of that stuff, um, that, that are adjustments and, yeah. and learning experiences. How has it been just performing for some of the early audiences? I saw it during a dress rehearsal, so I know that was oh, yeah. the first time yeah. you were up. Uh, well, um, the, a play like this with a lot of fast language yes. and a lot of, um, of, you know, one at least one of the four characters in the play that has a lot of movement um, and, and a lot of staging. And then there's physical elements in the production, like moving scenery and stuff like that. These things take such time to iron out. Mm -hmm. And so there's never been such a thing as a, as a perfectly brilliant dress rehearsal because you're still working things out. You can never be that ahead of schedule that by the time the audience comes, it's all down. Yeah. You're still, your mind is always processing things. So we did a pretty clean skate on on um, that dress rehearsal, but the show has definitely deepened and deepened and deepened, and we've done it maybe six or seven times now, and it's it's almost it's pretty much hit its stride uh -huh. as far as the command that we have over it. Right. And it's like practicing anything, right, over and over again. The more you do it, the better it gets, and 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 with this kind of play, which is kind of deep and kind of full of lots of details and stuff. Yeah. 
it's it, it's a kind of a, um, a, a bottomless well. You know, you don't you don't ever get bored of it because there's always something new to discover yeah. about it. That's the beauty of, of theater and yeah. live production. Yeah, and good plays. Exactly. And plays that are written with a kind of substance. Especially when you're in love with the play, too. Yeah, I, you have I, to I do. You do it all the time. I, I, I do, and, I, and this particular play is one of the uh, one of my favorite plays that I've ever been able to do. I, I, I love doing it. I could keep doing it forever. I understand why actors like Carol Channing and Yul Brenner played parts forever and ever. I used to think they were losers. <laughs> I used to think, oh God, put it away, Carol. You know, you're 80 years old, um, and she's going on tour with another tour of Hello Dolly. She maybe did seven, and Yul Brenner seven or eight tours of. of the, but when that part sings yes. for you, you want to keep doing it, and you know what you're giving the audience, and they're loving it. There's no way that you're going to give that up. No. So I don't see myself continuing to do this play <laughs> until I'm 80. But I understand. I understand the joy that one gets from that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could certainly do it because it I has could, that yeah. age progression, yes, it does, yeah. and you certainly don't age at all. So. Yes. Okay. <laughs> what I really walked away with from the play was that it's about manifesting destiny, and mm -hmm. you know. There's two characters, um, and one is able to just kind of move through the world and say, yes, everything is on my plate and I can grab it. Mm -hmm. That's Manford. And for your character, it's more or less like waiting for the opportunity to be told, like, it's now your time. And there's a line at the end where he, and I'm going to paraphrase as well, but like basically saying that, you know, I didn't know that it was my time, but now it's my time. Uh -huh. like, you know, it's always been there. Yeah. And I'm wondering how that parallels with your successful career that you've had. Oh, wow. I never made a par I never thought to parallel it that particularly personally. Uh, I have always considered him someone that I needed to learn about because he being um, um, uh, a, um, a, a, a citizen of communist China, yeah. you know, the, the, what was built into that Life, as p particularly at this in this time period, was a life of giving yourself, giving over your own wishes to the wishes of the party, mm -hmm. and not um, making choices for yourself. And what's a nice juxtaposition in the play is that this 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 balls to the wall Asian American yeah. kid who doesn't know anything about that just wants and and you know is is going after his his dream. Yes. And um, in, in comparison, this other character in China is um, giving up all of his dreams mm -hmm. because he, he, there's, no, there's no alternative for him because of the political circumstances that he is in. Personally, I, I, I guess what I could say is that when I was in high school, I was just so lucky to have had a very mentorial relationship with a high school drama teacher who recognized potential in me and who absolutely demanded that I uh, follow it or that I d not squander it mm. to the point where she like took me by the hand to my own parents and said, you know, I really think this person needs to uh, keep doing this. Wow. And my parents were rather typical Asian American second generation parents, they weren't super, 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 they weren't tiger parents. They were more though um, conditioned and uh, uh, assumed that the best thing for us would be successful and stable careers. Doctor or lawyer, that was it. Right. That was it. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and so m that was a huge paradigm shift for this person who was kind of an expert, right? She knew she was a drama teacher, not really, but she did <laughs> have credibility for my parents. Mm -hmm. And so so the, op the idea, when you say the idea of taking your shot or looking, following your bliss or uh, taking what you think is could be yours, mm -hmm. that came from outside forces that I was lucky to have been exposed to. Um, and I guess I do relate emotionally at the end of the play to someone who isn't able to do that. Yeah. And, and the, 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 
the, the whatever the complicated feelings that one has, not having to have that restriction, mm -hmm. the guilt you might feel, mm -hmm. survivor's guilt kind of thing, yeah. or it, what if it were me, you know. You know, really, we're all here just because we're here. We're, we don't get a choice to be communist Chinese or not communist Chinese. You know, and, and in this particular play, it really shows that you don't have a choice. Yes. And, and so I don't, you know, I think we all kind of take for granted our freedom and our ability to do whatever we want and to say whatever we want. Mm -hmm. Um, and the play kind of um, very, very uh, beautifully kind of reminds us of that. And I do like that part about the play. So I do relate to the character's inability to um, access his dreams um, based upon my ability to access my dreams, I guess. Yes. It's interesting because <laughs> um, a lot of times, you know, even like if we take the context out of the play of just being maybe an emerging artist mm -hmm. of color or part of the LGBTQ community, which you have been a huge advocate for both, um, I think it's quite difficult when we are going out to pursue those kinds of artistic dreams, whether it be in acting, dance, or even here in tech, if you don't see a role model, it's hard to really think about can I go out and like grab hold of those dreams? And it was great that you mentioned your high school mentor, but you know, as someone who may not have that, what is some advice that you would? Well, I, I, I may be, uh, advice, I have tons of advice. <laughs> but before I give advice, I think it's, in, and it is important to acknowledge that phenomenon of, um, of representation you know, we ah, we're at the, in this point now where we're talking about representation all the time, yeah. and it, it doesn't lose its meaning. But but what what I love to talk about what is absolutely essential about that representation is the influence that that representation has over younger people. Yes. Right. And that what we're really fighting for in our grown-up state is what well we want to see more Asians. But well, then I want to see my I want my stories to be told. I want to see sexy Asian people on the screen and all of that stuff. But what we really want is for the needle to, to shift because, the, because our kids don't have the, the, same, the same schism when it comes to looking, searching fruitlessly for themselves in the media. And it's, it is shifting in a way where the exposure is greater now. Yeah. And we do love that. And so my advice would be, I don't know, you know, I don't, I, I, I think it's, it's partly for me, it's always been kind of that hokey Gandhi thing that be the change you want to see thing, you know, that, that there's always someone that you can mentor. There's always someone, even if you're not famous, there's always someone that is looking to you for, and we, as role models, I think people forget that. That, that that thing is really happening. Mm -hmm. You don't see it happening, you don't feel it happening, but it's happening. Yeah. P young people are looking to you for an example of what yes. is, is they are going to be. They have no other frame of reference, but to see a person older and more experienced than them and to do as they do. Yes. And, to, and so our self-esteem is super important and our sense of sorting out all the baggage that our parents gave us and their <laughs> grandparents gave them sorting all that so that it's a little bit easier for them is a fun challenge, I think, because we're still dealing with our own baggage. But yeah. I think we do have less a little bit than, we, than our grandparents had. I hope so. We have different <laughs> kinds. Our grandparents didn't care about representation. You know, <laughs> True. They don't care at all about <laughs> it. Um, but then I do remember my, my parents' generation of people running into the, into the living room saying, oh my God, look, there's an Asian person on TV, like that kind of thing. And us all running into the, the, the living room. To, that wasn't that long ago. And, and there's still a sense of that now, right? Oh, look, wow, it's a commercial with an Asian person in it. Yeah. That's kind of a new trend, Yeah. commercials with Asian people in them. Um, well, because for whatever reason, we could talk about it forever about the the misnomer that Asian people, their money doesn't matter or something like that. Something so like now that, it's yeah. clearly true that it's been it's been established that the money does matter, and that's 
a good for us in a way, and it's certainly good for our representation. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. and I mean the success with Crazy Rich Asians. I mean, yeah. prove that it can be right, a right. Success. That it transcended being an Asian movie by being popular across the board. Everybody. Yeah. Yes, and that's what's really nice. Uh, I, I did hear it on a podcast that you did maybe a couple weeks ago with KQED. Uh -huh. um, what really struck me was you did talk about the responsibility that you have or producers or people who have that power of choosing story that they have this um, responsibility to create these images and characters so that y the younger generation can, you know, yeah. be inspired. So I'm wondering, like, what is is your personal responsibility for that? Are you having a hand in developing Oh yeah, contracts? you mean what am I doing? Yeah. Yeah, I, do, I am. I, I, I think that's one of the great, one of the things that comes out of frustration is the, is the creative limitations that you're given. Create, uh, if, you're, if you're up for it, mm -hmm. uh, opportunities for yourself or for others or for the people that you believe in that are experiencing the same kind of uh, marginalization as you. And, and so I have, I'm always working on things on my own, like trying to kind of maintain my relationship with theaters like ACT to kind of like, I'm already kind of thinking now what's next, what would I do here next, and, and kind of coming up with, you can't just pick one thing, you can't just go to Pam McKinnon, the artistic director, and say, oh, here's the one <laughs> thing I want to do, do it. You have to kind of give her kind of a landscape of things that might work and see whether any of them ap appeal to her. And, and all of those things, for me, involve um, Asian Americans or, um, uh, you know, uh, not just me or me as a character playing, you know, they're all explorations of, um, Reimaginations of, of a classic work or new work itself that uh, will do what this play that we're doing yeah. now is doing. Um, you know, when I talk about producers, I'm not exactly sure exactly what I said that time, but or don't remember exactly. But but I do feel that there's this phenomenon that we're all kind of well aware of that's very frustrating that we don't know what to do about it. And that is that thing is that unless it affects you, you often don't want to do anything about something. It's the kind of thing, you know, to use a very um, brutal example, it's like the people that are most championing cancer research and stuff are people that cancer has touched themselves, sure. right? Mm -hmm. And this is, this, is the, this is a kind of way, in some ways, for people to choose the things that mean most to them, which mm. is a nice thing. However, when it comes to Hollywood, the, the issue of diversity doesn't ring true for a lot of people, and th it kind of defines white privilege, mm -hmm. what, white, what we like to throw around this term, white privilege, because a person has no sense of yes. what that damage or what that pain or what that exclusion feels like. So they're in, the ones who are doing it are doing it because they know they're supposed to or whatever. So it, it, some way to get them to feel that is the thing that I think is, is an interesting challenge, to get them to understand, to take to heart. Um, um, it's the equivalent of, of going to a cancer benefit and, and a, like a big cancer gala or something and watching the video that they show yes. of what it means to a survivor or to their family or whatever. And you're going, oh, those are human beings. I relate to being a human being. That thing, I don't have to have cancer to know that this is important. Yeah. And that kind of sharing of that, because there are still so many producers and people that that are borderline. They're either doing it because they think they're supposed to, mm -hmm. and that's good, but they're still not really feeling it, or they don't get it at all. It doesn't occur to them. And, and I'm fascinated by that, because I personally am really, um, I don't consume a lot of things that are all white. Like I, when I see something that seems kind of like it's all white or not, it doesn't have any Asian people in it at all. I'm not as interested. I don't mm -hmm. connect to it. I mean, I um, and so I like like. I watched the other day. I watched Hidden Figures, which everybody loves. That movie, right? It's a great. It's a very satisfying movie. But I, I'm I'm less moved by it. Mm -hmm. I feel left out of it in some ways, because as we grew, as we as I've grown up, it was always like, are you black or white? There was right. a, like a kind of question that that was a very strange one to perceive people asking. Anyway, 
I don't know. That's just me going on about that question. I love it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> it's very interesting. But I, I, I um, kind of want to tag back on to what you just said about, well, I'm not a part of it. And I think that's kind of the narrative that a lot of Asian Americans feel that we're not part of the main narrative right. in Hollywood. Right. Um, kind of to tie back to Lauren and then you know, I know we're talking about the Great Leap, but the King of the Yees made a comment about, um, you know, in marketing, you know, there's the black people marketing, the Hispanic people. Yes, that's right. She talks about it, yeah. And then there's Asians, and we're all lumped into the Caucasian marketing plan, which yeah. I thought was a very interesting point. Um, and I'm wondering, how do we get more visibility out there? Like, how do we, like, raise our voices and say, hey, we matter, or, you know, make more stories about us because we want to watch it. Well, I would tie that into my being here today, really, because what I'm trying to do, I mean, the theater wants me to come and talk about the show, which is great, and I love talking about the show, but what I really want to do is to create a situation in which Asian people are really supporting their own content. Mm -hmm. Because the only way to perpetuate that content is for it to be successful. Yes. And and if Pam McKinnon, the, the uh, a Caucasian American uh, artistic director of American Conservatory Theater has a big dud with this play, she's less likely to do another one. And then we're all more likely to complain about it. Mm -hmm. And we're like, oh, well, ACT, they, they don't ever do. Well, did you go? Did you go exactly. see it? Exactly, exactly. And, 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 and for Asian American people, well, a lot of people, like human beings, they don't always understand how, the gesture of that, like doing your part, voting. Um, all of that yes. stuff, you know, like, <laughs> yes, it does matter that you vote. And yes, it does matter that you buy a ticket to see a play if you care about what the play can do for you, you know, the, the things that you're complaining about, yeah. that, that w we all complain about. Um, so that's an equation that I think could be more, made more clear. Yeah. And, and I love that. And I always try to tell people, oh, just, um, uh, try to support the content because the, con and, and we really did that in a big way with Crazy Rich Asians. Yes. That was really super gratifying to me and reassuring to me and encouraging to me that this generation of, of Asian Americans put their money where their mouth was and, and created a sense, whether it's true or not, that something has changed. You know, because there's a lot of articles out there now saying, has it really changed? Yeah. Or whatever, is it, what will happen next? There's a, a fair amount of Asian, Crazy Rich Asian knockoff action happening out there, which is a really good sign. It's great. That, that um, you know, I'm not into knockoffs, but I'm into the representation. So, <laughs> so I'll take it. But there, it's, it's absolutely, like there's gonna be a couple of television shows and all of that stuff. And um, that's really good. You do have to kind of, in some ways, if you're really, really responsible, you take note of the people that are sponsoring Asian content and try to kind of support them. That's what network television is kind of, um, one thing that it allows you to do is to see the corporations and the companies that support the things that we're trying to do. So it, it, we don't think about that, right? I don't think about yeah. it that much. I have to go, okay. And, and it, you go, oh, look, okay, so these people are sponsors of the, the whatever show, you know, I don't know, whatever it is. You know, I'm doing this Comedy Central show with Aquafina in right. the summer, and, and I can't wait to see who, who buys ad time on that show. Okay, last question. Uh -huh. I'd love to know what your mom thinks about all of this. <laughs> Because moms are important. Yes, because we are at the Asian Affinity Google Group, aren't we? We are, um, and mommies are important. You know, really, I have to say, I, st I consider my mother way more than I should in various everyday decisions, like buying underwear <laughs> stuff. I, I'm just so, it's so deeply ingrained to, to me to please her that, that I, that I think about her to a fault, and it's not good necessarily, not necessarily good for me sometimes, <laughs> um, but I do do it, and there are really positive side effects of that. And I must say that choosing this play to do it here and to do it here now, and to kind of, kind of drop everything if I, as much as I could to do it, because right. the time commitment that you, it takes to do a play is really intense. And that means being away from home, and I have a, a teenage son and all of that stuff. So choosing to do so 
uh, to do a play out of town was made infinitely more um, seductive or satisfying because my mom's here and because my mom is, you know, inviting uh, our, my whole family, my whole gigantic, her whole family, uh, who mostly are still in the Bay Area, to come to the matinee on Sunday, this Sunday, and then to have this big party and up oh. and stairs in the theater and do that kind of thing, you know? Because she is like a, she, there's no, there isn't one a, there isn't one prototypical uh, Chinese mom, but there are maybe four or five. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Yes. And my mom is the one who do will do anything not to brag, um, <laughs> at, by using bragging words. Oh. If you look closely, there's a lot of bragging going on, but it's very classy and it's very. She never says anything. She lets everyone else say nice things, and then she says, she just nods or something like that. You must be very proud. <laughs> so she is, is, is in, in that kind of, uh, it's kind of passive aggressive, you know, kind of like she, she doesn't want to, but, but, but it's wonderful to be the beneficiary or the recipient or the inspiration for her doing these things. Yeah. Inviting all of her, her family and friends to this thing and, and not pushing them to come see it, but telling them when it is and, and hoping that they come and then feeding them. <laughs> That's key. Yeah. That's key. Yeah, it's Food key. talks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, she's kind of a, a mascot of the production because the last time I worked at ACT, she kind of cozied up to the house staff, and so then <laughs> she would say to me, oh, I'm going to go shopping in Chinatown. I'll co I think I'm going to come and see the second act of the play and show up and they'd like let her sit in the back or whatever Aww. like that. And I said, well, you, you can't just show up. I mean, you have to like n meet the person or whatever. So she, but, but she is, she's tr treated very royally and it's very nice. It's very She's cute. like the Empress Dowager. <laughs> and she's very cute and, um, and, and she's very, she, she has a very, lovable personality she really does she she just like there that you know she's very infectious and very Aww. kind of smiley i love that yeah that's great thank you bd sure. we have our first question over here okay you're on hey bd hey um i'm also i noticed that you're a native san franciscan i know we've talked a lot of serious topics but we wanted to talk about something fun julie mentioned food talks <laughs> uh-huh and um you know i'm always curious about when actors kind of come home at least back to san francisco or actresses you know, what's your, what's your go-to? What is the one thing when you come back here that you need to have that kind of connects you back with your childhood mm. and some of these good, joyous memories? Uh, uh, a Capital Restaurant, Clay Street, chicken wings. Oh. They're famous that. chicken wings. And they're, I mean, like, I, I'm, I'm almost kind of like, you almost kind of want to not tell people about them because you, you want them for yourself. Um, but that comes to mind immediately. My family is obsessed with the House of Prime Rib on Van Ness. <laughs> Obsessed with it. And we go there, we like, I mean, at the like opening of an envelope, we will go there. It's, it's like, we, we, we'll go there for any occasion. We'll, we'll make up some special occasion to go there. <laughs> and um, a like, uh, so we do the High of Prime Rib whenever we can. We just did it a couple weeks ago. Um, Let's see, what else is there? Uh, Sunset Bakery, Chasu Bows. Mm. Um, that's on like 9th Avenue in Irving um, or Judah. And um, let's see, what else? Let's see, I'm going through all of my ethnic groups, Mexican. <laughs> um, you know, my Uncle Bobby, my mom's brother, uh, uh, replicated the, re you guys are mostly too young for this, but, but my Uncle Bobby replicated the recipe of the enchiladas at this place called the Hot House, which was um, at Playland at the beach, which was by the Cliff House, this like boardwalk that used to yeah. be there. And there used to be this like pass-through window rest, kind of precursor to a food truck kind of restaurant called the Hot House, and they had these very basic but delicious kind of um, uh, enchiladas. 
that came in a little cardboard tray. And he, my, so my uncle has kept that recipe alive um, and it makes that a big batch of this, this enchilada gravy that they, they made. And so that's a childhood memory of going to the hot house at the beach, because I grew up on 40th and Ortega, um, really close to the beach. Um, those are the hot top five, I think, the ones that those come to mind. Then there'll good. be more that come to mind, and I'll, I'll blurt them out like Tourette's. Please do. <laughs> yeah. Sweet, thank you. Sure. We'll go right over here. Thanks again for coming today, VD. Sure. Um, this is a little bit more of a, a personal uh, question. So I went to acting school uh -huh. in New York many years ago. Uh, when I graduated, it was the early aughts, and I walked into an industry that uh, was not particularly looking for dudes who looked like me. Yeah. And I wanted to talk, you talked a lot about representation today. Yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, the pipeline issue. And, and for me, I got out of the game, and I'm very right. ashamed to admit that. And um, it was really hard for me, but mm -hmm. I, I, I had those prototypical parents who were like, chase your dream, chase your dream. And then it became, I can't do this anymore. Right. Mm. So I, I guess my question is, what would you say to all of the folks who now are going into an industry that is just slightly more friendly to folks yeah. like us uh, to keep them in the game and to keep that side of the pipe? Oh, great. That is a really good positive-based question. Thank you. And, and you know, this, the good things come from pain. And if, that, if your pain created this question and changes somebody's life, that's probably a good thing. Uh, but I will say that, just before I answer, is that that pain, that rejection, and that uh, shame are universal, right? They're, they're not your own. And you know, you have to blame really the situation much more than yourself for that, mm -hmm. that the outcome of that. Um, you seem perfectly happy now, so I'm, I'm, I trust that that's... We'll see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and what I would say, well, I, I, would, I wouldn't say anything that's that different from what people told me when I first started, when it was considerably different, which was, if you absolutely have to do it, then do it. And if you don't, you should think of something else. It's super difficult. It's, it messes with your mind. It messes with your self-esteem. It messes mm -hmm. with your sense of self-worth, your sense of um, what success means. And um, you have to be, you have, a, have to have an extremely strong constitution and an extremely um, accessible support system. And I feel like you're right that, that the needles move to the point where young people, you, you know, you want to kind of slap them for the things that they complain about, right? Um, because it was so much harder before. And it is so much, there's so much more opportunity now. But with that opportunity comes m uh, more competition. And, and I certainly feel that from the beginning of my career, there was less competition. And the competition has grown. And the, the amount of younger people in the industry has grown. But, but so also has the amount of um, Asian American writers and the amount mm -hmm. of producers and people that are actually making an in influential choices. So I would just say that they really should not take for granted, especially given what you're saying, they should not take for granted any progress that's been made. But you know, young people are so clueless sometimes, right? Because we, and, and rightly so, because we can't know anything that happened before us. We can hear about it and we can take it to heart. When, 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 my, when we talked to my son who was born in 2000 about 9-11, he understands the gravity of it. He doesn't feel the emotion of it. He's, he wasn't there to watch on television the absolute devastation and the loss and the emotional feelings. So if he, uh, you guys know that this show, Come From Away, came into town a, a, a few weeks ago. Yes. Come From Away is about a nine, centered around the day of 9-11 and the yeah. days after. And oh, it's one thing where if you're of a certain age and you're sitting in the audience of that show, Everyone in the audience is having the same emotional experience, which is a very rare thing. Mm. You, 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 you can't, in, in Lauren's play, she's having to explain certain really um, heavy things that have happened yes. in its history. And you get it from understanding what she's taught you about it. Come From Away starts and it says, today's 9-11 and everyone starts crying immediately. And it's kind of great. Anybody born after 9-11 doesn't really understand. I'm, I'm, this is a tangent to try to describe that these 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 rather adorable young people that are becoming actors <laughs> don't really understand the the 
things that were built on the backs of other people, right? This is an, an ongoing discussion about everything, about AIDS, about gay people and AIDS, and, and about the Holocaust, and everything, everything major that has ever happened, or every pain that any generation has experienced is really hard to, to, for the following generation to feel. So we cut them a little bit of slack, and we try to kind of, um, uh, for me, I think a sense of discipline and a sense of entitlement. Um, a, a discipline needs to be encouraged, and entitlement needs to be kind of, you know, smacked out of people sometimes. And and so, but but the advice I would give is that you, it it requires an absolutely um, steadfast uh, constitution, and um, that there's great joy to be had in it, and that that there's something actually kind of noble about it. There is a sense that I learned from my first acting teacher that you are a messenger, and that if the messages that you're giving are true and are positive, and they make people think, or they make people act differently, mm -hmm. then you've done something, or you've acted as an agent to something actually happening. So it's not just kind of glamour and kind of yeah. um, um, acting and applause and stuff like that. It could be rather useful in society. So thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. We have a question over here. Oh, hey. Hi, Vidi. Uh, thanks again for coming out. Um, just wanted to ask you a question as um, an Asian American who's also grown up with like second generation parents, um, you know, if you ever traveled back to China and if and when you did, did you ever, how was that experience for yeah. you? And you know, how, how were you able to channel that when you were, um, you know, acting during the play? I went to China on one, um, two major times. Um, the first time I went, um, my dad was still alive and I was booked to be the guest speaker on a cruise that went to China. And it was a super duper, hilariously fancy cruise <laughs> with all super old white people. But I was supposed to talk about being a Chinese person to them. Oh. You know, I was like, it was a little bit like a zoo. You know, it's like, oh, feeding time is at 4.15. BD Wong will come out and you can throw pretzels at him. But it was a really, really, uh, in many ways, moving experience. My dad had not been back to Hong Kong since he wa he left Hong Kong. My dad, my it, it, oddly enough, my grandfather was born in California. My d grandfather went back home to marry my grandma and to have my dad, and then brought them back. So my dad was technically not bought, brought born here, but he was born a citizen, um, and. And so he had this very like, oh my gosh, this is where I was born kind of thing that he w that really snuck up on him. He, I don't think he ever even thought about going back, but here was this opportunity. We went back, so that was that. And um, uh, there's just I wish I could talk for an hour about this cruise. It was it was so funny because Sounds amazing. Well, well, I'll, first of all, I will <laughs> tell you that the one thing is it was so fancy that they they give you this little uh, thing to fill out when you come in when you check into your room and the thing t asks you what kind of liquor they they want you to stock the um the uh, bar with the refrigerator with okay and you get four bottles of each or something like that and my mom is a white wine drinker and my dad was a Jack Daniels drinker so they got four bottles of white wine and four bottles of Jack Daniels and then that night they put all eight bottles in their suitcase, <laughs> and they filled out the form again. Of course. By the end of the cruise, they had like a Bevmo in un <laughs> under the bed. <laughs> I don't want to say, you know, it's racial profiling to say that this is because they're Chinese, <laughs> but you know, no pun intended. You do the math. <laughs> Um, I, I went on a second trip to China um, in 2003 to make a terrible television movie, but I, that was a really interesting cultural experience for me as well, working with Chinese people and working in the Chinese film uh, industry um, in rural China. And I, I, I think really, you know, I hope you'll come see the play. Lauren talks about the experience of being an Asian American and going to China mm -hmm. as a very unique kind of odd fish out of water experience. And that is an experience I felt. I didn't really feel like I was home or anything like that. Um, I felt it, it's, it's so obvious to them 
that you're American before you even open your mouth. They just you can you just you can't hide it. And so there's always a kind of either a curiosity or a slight disdain over you. And and so I felt that tension and that was no different than the, the way that the, uh, the, 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 the young woman in the play describes it in, in, in Lauren's play. So apparently Lauren understands that kind of yes. experience too. It's pretty common. Um, did I answer the question? Not really. I think you did, or you kind of. <laughs> you said good things, but you did not answer the question. But we learned about the BevMo. What, what was, the, what was the, the, the specific question? I can answer it now. I guess. Oh, how did I draw on it for the, yeah. in the play? Well, I would say that, um, uh, how did I draw on it for the play? I did re really related to Lauren's words about being an Asian American going to China. And I think what I had to do, uh, really the research about how shut down a, a Chinese person who's um, not, a, not a dream seeker, you know, a, a person who is a of a certain constitution, who is a party member of the, uh, you know, a member of the party, and very obedient and very diligent. Yep. What there, that is a very different kind of person than me, and and so I did have to kind of access whatever else I feel in my life that shuts me down or uh, quiets me, or keeps me from making decisions, and I do do relate to feeling like when I, like a younger man being closeted and mm -hmm. feeling kind of restricted by my sense of being closeted and a sense of not being able to be free and open and, and, and speak my own truth. So that's the thing I would relate to, I think, more than going to China, actually. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. I'm just going back and forth because it makes sense. Awesome. Um, so I think a lot about inequity. It's a very heavy topic. Yes. Um, but I think a lot about inequity. Um, and one thing I've been thinking a lot about is the importance of um, Asian Americans needing to leverage their privilege in order to stand in deep solidarity with other communities of color, so black and brown communities. And I know obviously there's a nuance in various industries. You know, I think the tech industry, we're highly represented here, yeah. um, and that looks different in other places. But I wanted to hear a little bit more from you around how you think about um, Asian Americans building that solidarity with, with other communities of color in the entertainment industry and, and what you see happening on that front. It's a, such a wide-reaching, far-reaching industry, right? You have Hollywood, and here we are. I'm working at a, at a regional theater, and the regional theater has its own agenda and mm -hmm. aspirations for community building and for community fundraising and all of that stuff. And they're different, I think. The, 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 the wider um, Hollywood industry is driven by a kind of bottom line kind of thing that makes it really hard for um, this, these, this needle to shift. And I don't know if actually this, this might be a similar kind of tangent, but what, what your question is reminding me of is my own um, baggage about fundraising. Like for example, when I'm, I'm pushing up the mountain several of my own projects, I've co-written a musical mm -hmm. uh, that I'm trying to, uh, to, to, to continue to develop. And I have, say, uh, a, a several, a, a several other projects, a lot of theater projects. And I find myself, uh, um, one of them is one that our friend is, has been involved in, who, a uh, mutual friend, who, which is a very diverse cast of, of actors. And other uh, projects are Asian American projects. And I find myself trying to edit myself when it comes to whose money I'm going after. Like, I, I, I found like, oh, you can't ask an Asian American person to help me fund the diverse project. You should really be getting the Asian American person to fund the Asian American project. But I think, well, wait a second, though. But I'm the Asian American making this project. Will that be enough for them to support me mm -hmm. to help move the needle in that way? Because my work as a, as a writer will be uh, put on the map, and then um, w I will be able to uh, have the credibility to create more and more content. And as it, as it turns out, this particular diverse project ends up having a lot of Asian people in it, yeah. but it's not an Asian project. And so is there a kind of, what I'm saying is that I perceive there to be some kind of invisible um, limit to the amount of support I can get from the Asian American community like from Asian people that have money. I think, oh, I have to be really careful about who I ask money for and what it's for. They, they'll want me to just, 
they'll want me to just do all Asian content, I think. And so that's interesting because I guess what I, as I'm repeating, is I'm an Asian American artist and that's the, um, the content that I'm generating. But, but I know that doesn't really specifically answer your question. I'm also just me and I don't really understand or know what's going on out there necessarily about the connections between different groups and how, um, you know, Ken Savage, who was up here before, um, no, was he up here yet? No, he wasn't up here yet. Ken Savage, who works at ACT and brought me here today, is um, was talking about how he, ha he has been in this building before because he also did a Google Talk with the um, uh, the Black Google Live group. EGN, yeah. Be yeah, mm -hmm. and and so that shows you that that kind of accessing the different groups within the theater, the theater, the theater is a, an active thing that's happening. Um, uh, but I think you're absolutely right. That kind of solidarity is really helpful. I think everybody has their own kind of agenda and their own kind of unique challenges, and that sometimes makes things difficult, as you can imagine. Yeah. Thank you so much for the questions. Sure. We are out of time. Really? So yeah, I know. It's been so much fun. So I'm sorry for those who couldn't ask the questions. Um, but. BD, I just want to thank you so much for being Thanks. here today. And for those who don't know, please go watch the show. It's running at ACT Gary Stage, The Great Leap, until March 31st. So thank you again. Thanks.